we're just bang on three o'clock, which is the way I like it. Uh, the second thing I like is to see people putting their hands into their pockets, not to give money to the Institute, but to turn <laughs> off your mobile phone. Now, please. Um, one other bit of housekeeping. The exit that you came in is the exit out of which you will leave this building in the case of an emergency. So have a good look as to where you currently are. Um, Dominic Grieve, you are very welcome once again in this, Thank you. not this particular building, but to be with us. The size of the crowd should indicate to you very clearly how much interest there is in this topic, but more to the point, what interest there is in the way in which you have conducted yourself over the last couple of years in what is an extraordinary series of events happening to our nearest and in many cases dearest neighbour. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the hospitality, the lunch, the conversation, uh, and now the opportunity, I suppose, to give myself a veneer of respectability. Uh, when, when I was Attorney General of England and Wales, I thought I held a respectable post. Uh, and uh, it's therefore been rather a strange process for me in the uh, four years that have followed since I left that office to find myself being variously described as a traitor, uh, a saboteur, uh, a scumbag, and I think also a, a bespectacled Che Guevara, which I think was probably intended to be flattering. <laughs> um, but it does rather highlight the strange revolutionary situation that we find ourselves in in the United Kingdom, and which I know, of course, has such an immediate and really worrying bearing on all of you and on everybody in Ireland. So what I thought I would try to do this afternoon was to firstly just look a little bit, I don't want to go over old ground too much, but why we are where we are just at this very moment. I don't wish to go back too far in history, but just a tiny bit. And then to try to look forward to what is my best take on what may happen over the next three to four months and perhaps beyond, but very mindful of the fact that we are living in such turbulent times that predictions are likely to prove, in many cases, to be inaccurate. But I do think that one can certainly see some key strands in what's happening, and those may at least provide a clue for where things are going. And at the end of that, I can stop talking and we can have a conversation, and you can challenge me on all of this. And by the time we finish this meeting, I will be much better informed, which is, of course, the ma absolutely major purpose of such gatherings. So let's just go back a moment to 2016 and the referendum. The referendum, as I realised when I went round the country in 2016, I twigged that we were going to lose it. I was a Remainer, and I realised <coughs> we were not going to win it about halfway through. Afterwards, there was this big thing about this being the revolt of the marginalised. And, of course, it's absolutely true that if I speak to my Labour colleagues, with whom I'm often cooperating very closely nowadays, uh, they will point out that in constituencies in the northeast of England and the Midlands, there were large numbers of people who were actually, arguably, economically highly dependent on the free market operating by the, through the EU, uh, working in Nissan factories and, uh, and uh, automotive industry, who decided to vote Leave because they felt that the benefits which had flown to the United Kingdom from men membership had been sort of concentrated in the financial sectors of the southeast, brought about a very happy revolution down there, change, but they had not, were not direct beneficiaries. And in the post-2008 period, particularly their uh, earnings were static, and their costs of living were rising. But actually, that was only half the story. I remember going down and giving a lecture on the UK Constitution in uh, Devon. And it was given by a local family who were philanthropists, and therefore they gave two lectures a year. They also owned Clavelli Village, so they had a lot of revenue that came from the people who have to park at the top in order to visit the village, which they own. And they devoted some of that to improving the village and these two lectures. And this was attended by an audience of farmers, 
landowners, local businessmen, some had actually a share in the Appledore shipyard, which was making at that time patrol vessels. It was their last order. It's shut now, making patrol vessels for the Irish Navy. Uh, and then there were some retired city financiers with toy estates and some academics and some diplomats. And apart from the academics and the diplomats, they were all voting leave. So these were people with massive stakes in British society, and I can think of quite a number of them, including some who were personal friends, who took the opportunity of the 2016 referendum to stick two fingers up at something that they found irksome, without necessarily being able, I think sometimes, to identify what it was about it that they really didn't like. And in that sense, the extraordinary part of it was that in the context of the UK, with this long collective memory of um, exceptionalism, I'm always very struck by exceptionalism, particularly in England, this view, I mean, you have it in Ireland as well, this view that we are in a country, we live in a country which is different from elsewhere with a different historical tradition, something you can see going back over centuries. You can see it in the 15th century. Uh, you can almost trace it back to Magna Carta, but it was certainly well established by the late medieval period that you can't entangle yourself in these supranational institutions and not in some way be tarnished by them. And it was a very powerful force in the referendum. But the irony is that the people who all went to vote leave did it in the name of tradition, whereas actually what they were initiating was revolutionary chaos. Because then untangling a 50-year relationship... Uh, which has incredibly complex legal and economic aspects in our national life, was never going to be an easy thing. And we can see how that's played out since. The Conservative Party is put into immediate crisis. The Prime Minister resigns within 45 minutes. The new Prime Minister steps in. She's a compromise choice. That's a very conservative thing to do. She comes in and she tries to square the circle. And, you know, lots of criticism has been heaped on Theresa May. I haven't found her easy as Prime Minister. I've known her for well over 40 years because we were at university together and been friendly with each other. Uh, but in truth, she tried to do the classic British thing. She tried to respond to what she saw as a sacred duty, was the way she described it, given to her by the electorate to take us out, but to try to minimise the risks that she could plainly see to our economic well-being and uh, our uh, national security that flowed from Brexit. And look what happened to her. The longer this debate has proceeded, the more polarised the opinions have become. And interestingly, as we can see with the leavers, people who were quite cheerfully saying that a Norway-style relationship in 2016 was exactly what they aspired to, are now saying that only the purest of total separation will restore our sense of national worth. So the Prime Minister goes away and negotiates. She has great difficulty with her own cabinet. When she finally gets a common cabinet position, four key members walk out, including Boris Johnson last summer. She eventually achieves a deal which, in my view, is remarkably unsatisfactory, but is the product of her own red lines, which she'd put in in order to respond to what she perceived to be the imperatives given to her by the majority of the voting electorate, and she then has it defeated by a majority of 220 in the House of Commons in January, plunging her and the country into a second stage of this crisis. And, of course, it has undermined her. My hope, I have to say, it's been going on for nine, ten months that I started speaking out and saying that the only solution was to go back and ask the public again, in the second referendum, what they really wanted, because otherwise we were just going to go into ever-descending circles. But that has not, on the whole, commended itself to my colleagues. I'll come back to that in a moment. But the consequence is that 6 January, the Prime Minister, who I encouraged, I said to her, look, look where you are, reach out across the House and see if you can get from the Labour Party a willingness to back a referendum, in which case I think you can get a referendum through on your deal against Remain. But she wouldn't do it. Absolutely would not touch it, because that was undermining 
her commitment to the to she had made. So instead, she tried to take a battering ram with ever lessening power as her authority has been sucked away to trying to get her deal through. And as you will know, she came to within 30 votes, but there is a hard core of the ERG in my party who have become completely Talibanized. But in fairness to them, their Talibanization is in itself a reflection of a body of opinion within the Conservative Party membership, which I, I, these group on the whole of very well-meaning, pragmatic people, I have 1,300 members in my constituency, of whom now clearly a significant majority feel that the national humiliation which has been engendered by the Brexit process can again only be responded to by a hard Brexit. You should see the number of emails I get saying, where's your Dunkirk spirit? To which I say, well, yes, but Dunkirk was Dunkirk. Why should I self-inflict Dunkirk on my country? Thank you very much. Dunkirk was actually a terrible moment of collapse of British power, masked by Churchill's rhetoric. Why should I inflict that? But there seems to be this masochistic streak. We all pull together, blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And it's all there and coming out from this group, particularly within the core membership of the party. So we ended up with the Prime Minister finally running out of road, being shown the black spot by the 1922 committee. And as she's a person who puts the party at the absolute heart of her life, she's got no children, she's, been, she's never happier than when going out and knocking on people's doors. I mean, she still does it. On Saturday afternoon, she will be out knocking on people's doors when she was Prime Minister, right through the crisis, or attending local constituency functions. And so finally she ran out of road because she saw that she was facing a probable meeting of chairman of the associations who would pass a motion of no confidence in her in mid-June, and that's what prompted her to go. And now we've got to pick up the pieces. You can see for yourselves what's happening with the Conservative leadership election. Apart from my good friend Rory Stewart, who stood iconoclastically on a platform which was to say, nobody's telling you the truth and this is what the truth is. Uh, everybody else started essentially peddling fantasies. But the fantasies are necessary because if you don't peddle the fantasies, you are going to have no traction with the majority of the Conservative electorate, 0.25% the membership. I say Conservative, the Conservative membership electorate. The people who actually vote Conservative don't think this way at all. But you're going to have absolutely no traction with them. So both Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson have been really singing from a very similar hymn sheet, one of robustness, we will get a new deal, or we will leave without a deal. This is our sacred path. This is what we will do, and we will carry it out. Which begs the question, firstly, that the moment one of them gets into Downing Street, the civil servants will be pointing out, if they don't already realise it, just how disastrous a no-deal Brexit would be for our country. Uh, and secondly, uh, the fact that there is no majority in the House of Commons for a no-deal Brexit. Although whether that majority will ever manifest itself in a way that is coherent enough to stop a no-deal Brexit is another matter, but I shall just come back to that in a moment. We're not helped by the fact that the Labour Party is in a state of total collapse. You can read your newspaper about the anti-Semitism allegations, and some of you may have watched last night the Panorama program, which was devastating. But the truth is that Labour was hijacked when they elected Jeremy Corbyn as their leader. He is an astonishing individual because he's the only person I have ever come across who succeeds in having both Trotskyites and Stalinists working in the same office. <laughs> but apart from that, apart from that, there is no evidence that he is capable of delivering anything at all. He has spent a career making speeches to people who entirely agree with him. He's never sat in the chamber to participate in debates. I remember what he would do. He would come in, make a speech, and walk out again 15 minutes later, having said whatever he thought ought to be said. He's less cuddly than he looks. He's an extreme left-wing socialist. 
And he's leading a party which has gradually and painfully come to the realization, even amongst the adulatory young who thought he was so different from anything they'd ever seen before, that he is not going to be capable of delivering a thing. But meanwhile, the consequence is that Labour is utterly paralysed. And you can watch the fragmentation. There's no leadership. The whips have difficulty whipping. Uh, normally, in a political party, you'll have it here. Even if you disagree with the lines taking, if you have some faith in the leader, you'll go along with it for the sake of cohesion. But they can't deliver that. So they're always going to have MPs peeling off or going home on Tuesday when I tried to do my amendments on prorogation, um, Labour MPs left between the first and second vote. They just drifted off because there's no authority to keep them there, even though they appeared to be quite content with the amendments that I put forward. And I don't think he's in a position to win an election, uh, even if one were held very quickly, uh, and even in, in with the current state of the Conservative Party. So the reality is that they cannot deliver what an opposition can normally do, which is a moderating force, if only by challenge, because they are incapable of delivering it. And the, that said, there are lots of Labour MPs who are in despair, who are acting autonomously and independently, and one of the very few things that has given me real pleasure over the last two years is the cross-party working relationships that have been built up. And where I frequently, I give away great secrets, but I find myself spending almost more time with Labour and indeed sometimes Liberal or SNP members than with some of my own colleagues, but not on my own, often with a group of other Conservative colleagues uh, with me. And as a consequence, we are now going to be in for an extraordinarily difficult three months. I think the Conservative leadership election is really done and dusted, unless there's been some extraordinary misunderstanding of the dynamics of the party membership. I think the evidence is overwhelming that Boris Johnson will win, and probably by a very substantial margin, although it's just possible that the events of the last 48 hours over Kim Darrick's resignation and Boris's extraordinary behaviour in respect of it uh, might have some dent even amongst Conservative membership audiences. He will take over on the 24th of July, 5 p.m. approximately. Some people have suggested that La Labour might immediately try to mount a no-confidence motion in him, with a view actually to preventing him virtually taking up office at all. I personally don't think that will happen, because they have at least five Labour MPs who will vote probably with the government on such a motion of no confidence because they are now announced that they're leaving at the next election. Kate Hoey springs to mind and they are very keen on delivering Brexit before they go. And I suspect they won't quite know if they can trust others and I think they will deduce correctly that there are an insufficient number of Conservative MPs willing at that stage to bring down their own government uh, to make it viable. So we'll all then go away. The buckets and spades and the children are waiting, and we will be gone within 24 hours, leaving Boris Johnson to sort himself out at number 10 Downing Street to form his cabinet. And that's going to be quite an entertaining uh, spectacle in itself because he has promised an awful lot to a very large number of people. <laughs> and somehow he's going to have to reconcile those promises with forming a balanced cabinet. As he's announced that all the current ex-Remainer cabinet ministers, with the possible exception of those like Amber Rudd, who seem to have signed a new pledge of loyalty to No Deal, uh, will all be excluded, it is going to be a very radical turnaround indeed. He's then going to have a month to negotiate with the EU, which is not easy, as you know, to negotiate with the EU Commission in August unless you run around the beaches of the south of France. So I don't quite know how that's going to be achieved. Uh, he is then going to find himself in early September coming back to what is, I'm afraid, will be a growing political crisis. Now, how is it going to play out? And I will try to explain to you what I think the dynamics are. Firstly, within the Labour Party, and I'll touch on this at first, I think it is quite possible that by the time we get to late September, 
the Labour Party will shift at the party conference to a Remain position. So not only should we have a negotiated deal, you know their position's been entirely opaque. Any deal that we do doesn't need a referendum, but any deal the government does needs a referendum, and no deal needs a referendum. But they, Jeremy Corbyn doesn't really believe any of that. I think if he's going to survive, he is probably going to be forced to accept a referendum in all circumstances. But whether that's going to make any significant difference for Labour as long as he remains leader, I think is very questionable. Because I think his authority and credibility is completely shot. But whether Labour are able to get rid of him and replace him with somebody who does have credibility, whether it's a Hillary Benn or an Yvette Cooper uh, or a Keir Starmer, I simply don't know. But I do think that by early October, Labour may be in a more coherent place, at least, about remaining in the EU, campaigning to remain in the EU, and wanting a referendum as a central pillar of their policy. The last opinion polls show that over 80% of their supporters want to stay in the EU and want a referendum. It's an extraordinary situation where the leader of the party doesn't want any of those things. On the Conservative Party, you can see for yourselves that the major problem is that a large number of my colleagues who are very sensible, good people, are running scared of their associations. We have all, me included, been subject to uh, special general meetings, to attempts by Mr Aaron Banks to foment our removal. In my case, it's probably going to be successful, but not yet anyway, a bit longer to go. Um, and uh, also, other, other MPs have been targeted, including those who've just been loyally following the party line. I mean, David Gork, as Lord Chancellor, should be the subject of a determined effort to get rid of him in his constituency, which took place last week and which he defeated. It just shows the extent of the problem. <coughs> the, but most of my colleagues, as a consequence of that, just want to keep a low profile. They just want the problem somehow to go away. That having been said, there is a significant number of Conservative MPs, 40 is a figure that's sometimes put forward, who think that a no-deal Brexit is a completely unacceptable outcome. And I think, and that's the view of my colleagues who I work with, and don't necessarily share all my views, I'll come to that, that if it comes close to the crunch, then we will see again what we saw in April when we were running up against the wire of leaving on April the 12th, which is a sufficient number of Conservative members of Parliament prepared to defy the whip in order to do something to stop no deal. Beyond that, though, opinions start to diverge. You have a group which includes, in truth, five current members of the Cabinet, who, in an ideal world, would like, firstly, to ensure that no deal Brexit doesn't happen, but secondly, would like to use the failure of a no deal Brexit to finally bring reason to the Conservative Party and across the House and deliver some sort of deal, which I suspect is going to look very similar to what the Prime Minister negotiated. They think that that will be achievable because the fear of the continuing deterioration in the Conservative Party's position vis-à-vis -vis the Brexit Party may finally bring rationality to some members of the ERG who will be willing to support this. And that coupled with about 27 Labour MPs who want to leave the EU but don't want a no-deal Brexit will be sufficient to get the, uh, a deal across the line. I don't know whether that is possible or not. I mean, I'm speaking for myself, as you'll appreciate. As I'm a Remainer, I would like to try to arrange for us to remain in the EU, and the only mechanism for doing that is a referendum. So that's where I would like to end up. I campaign as part of the People's Vote campaign. But I do recognise that lassitude, anxiety, and concern about the future and the polarisation of politics in the UK may bring people to the conclusion that they have to go along with it. 
But I must say that on its own at the moment, I don't see it as working unless, for example, there were a significant change to the Northern Ireland backstop. Because these things have become talismanic. And I just don't see that without that change, you're ever going to get enough ERG members willing to support it. So even if you get the 27 Labour MPs, there will still be 40, 50 or 60 members of the ERG who will rebel. It would need some significant shift on the backstop, time limiting it or something else, in order to bring about that change. In which case, we would presumably leave the EU into what remains of the transition period. My anxiety, obviously, then, is that we will have no agreement internally in the UK as to what the future relationship should be. And therefore, I apprehend we're going to have another two to three years of disordered politics, perhaps longer. So I've never seen this as a satisfactory solution. The alternative is that, confronted with the prospect of a no-deal Brexit, enough of my Conservative colleagues are prepared to contemplate a referendum, and I think that's possible, that, coupled with a Labour clear insistence on a referendum, could tip the balance and lead to a referendum being the preferred outcome of the House of Commons. Although how Boris Johnson can ever then deliver that is much harder to tell. And of course that then calls into question whether a Boris Johnson administration can survive such a process. And if he doesn't survive that process, well then the risk is that we could end up toppling him on a no confidence motion and that could precipitate a general election which oddly enough neither, or perhaps not surprisingly enough, <laughs> neither the Conservatives nor the Labour Party want at all because it looks as if it could be apocalyptic for both main parties. And I think you're going to see over September and October a political minuet unfolding at Westminster between trying to pass some primary legislation against the government's wishes to prevent the Prime Minister taking us out with no deal and to try to force a Prime Minister to get an extension but you must understand that Parliament constitutionally cannot order a Prime Minister to revoke because it needs a money resolution, and that can only be done with ministerial agreement. That's how our constitution operates since 1713, at least. Money resolutions belong wholly in the province of ministers and not of the House of Commons itself. And it's something to do with the English Civil War. As you may recollect, when we started in England, governing without the government wasn't a very successful enterprise, and on the whole, it doesn't commend itself to me very much. So we can't do that. We're limited in what we can do. So that may be one way forward. The other way, as I say, is that the crisis simply deepens to the point where you end up with a no-confidence motion, and people are prepared to risk, take the risk of bringing down Boris Johnson's government, which might happen, although then I think there might be some efforts at trying to set up some form of government of national unity in the 14 days thereafter. But the arithmetic, it's not easy to see how you're going to do that unless Labour change radically in the period over the summer and probably get a new leader. Because I don't see anybody accepting Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister of a national unity government. The two don't quite go together. <laughs> Meanwhile... Economically, the UK is suffering as a result of these uncertainties, and I don't need to tell you this as an audience because you're the direct beneficiaries with the trillion pounds of assets floating over to Dublin, plus Citibank and all sorts of other institutions. Although I think it can sometimes be, one must slightly exaggerate its overall dent on the UK's, uh, London's position as a financial centre, but it's not good news. The manufacturing sector are also suffering very much. So this is a very difficult... Um, cocktail of problems. But I wouldn't want to stop talking on a negative note because I happen to remain a perennial optimist. I'm not quite sure why, and there have been moments in the last three or four weeks when I've begun to think my optimism is misplaced. But the great British ship of state can list a lot and take off water, but it has good self-writing mechanisms. And I just begin to see one glimmer of hope, which is that some of the discussion has now become so crazy that I think people are beginning to pick up that we're, we're going mad. I mean, the bit about prorogation of Parliament is in the absolutely crazy category. And the fact that Boris Johnson wasn't even able to say that he wouldn't contemplate such a thing... <coughs> 
I was interested to note that even Michael Howard, who has a reputation as a very hard Brexiter, came out yesterday saying that this was a completely idiotic idea. So just perhaps the first glimmer of light is beginning to creep in within my own party of the damage we're doing to ourselves and our standing and our reputation. And I would like to, and I think that as the Brexit deadline approaches, we may see more reasonableness grow and a greater determination to try to put country before uh, rather narrower interests. And I also sense it with Labour. And if we can get that mood music together, then I think we may be successful. Um, I feel a bit apologetic coming over here, um, because on the face of it, I think we've got quite a lot to apologise about. You're our nearest neighbour. And uh, on the face of it, um, we are causing you a lot of disturbance uh, of a kind that good neighbours should try to avoid. Um, I can only say to you that looking at the course of Irish history, you have to accept that perhaps British stroke English history has similar moments of catharsis. Um, and at least at the moment, we're not actually killing each other in the streets. So we should look on the bright side uh, of what's going on. Uh, if we keep a sense of humour, I am fairly confident we will get through it satisfactorily. Thank you very much. Thank you.